Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for today. Thank you for the songs of worship, uh, especially being able to sing scripture back to you. And so, Lord, I thank you for Keith and for the choir and the praise team and their preparation. And, Lord, we just want to say we love you for scriptural, biblical music full of deep theology. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word for your glory. We desire your manifest presence to be among us for your will to be done, for your name to be praised. So I pray that we would give you our undivided attention and our obedience and that we would receive the word of God this morning as the word of God and not as a word of man. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we're going to look there at Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The title of this morning's message is The Glorious Gospel, part 2. As I started with the same message last week and we did an overview of the book of Romans. Now we are ready to lower the plow and to dig in. And so let's go ahead and read the first seven verses, which is the first unit of thought. As a matter of fact, there's a new unit of thought in verse 8. That's the reason I'm not preaching all the way through verse 8. My goal as I preach the book of Romans is to preach the unit of thoughts. Okay? And uh, in the theological world, those are known as pericopes. I'm sure you don't care. But uh, my goal is to preach the entire pericopes, the whole unit of thought. So that that's the best way, I believe that you can gain a true understanding of the message that Paul is getting across. So let's look there, the first unit of thought, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness, by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those who are in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I have read through this passage in the Greek New Testament. I've read through it in just about every English translation that you can find. And uh, I've memorized it. And now I'm ready to... I, I, I've read Calvin and Warfield and uh, uh, this names that you probably... Stott. I mean, I've read so many different people on the book of Romans. Uh, let me just say that I'm ready to preach. Fritz Keisler. Some of you may know, especially if you're a musician. I didn't know, but he was, he was a world-famous violinist who lived between 1875 and 1962. He earned a fortune with his concerts and compositions, but he generously gave most of his money away. So when he discovered that an exquisite, rare violin on one of his trips, he wasn't able to buy it. Later, having received enough money, he went back to buy the violin only to learn that the violin had already been sold to a collector. Keisler made his way to the collector's home and he offered to buy the violin. The collector said that no, it had become one of his prized possessions and he would not sell it. Well, keenly disappointed, Keisler asked the man a question. He said, well, do you mind if I play the violin at least before I go? The collector gave the violin over to Keisler, and Keisler began to play. And the man's heart was so moved by the music that he heard. He said, take it. It's yours. And let the world hear it. You see, one man was a collector. The other was a practitioner. Take it. It's yours, and let the people or let the world hear it. You know, that's the same feeling I get with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, when I think about the gospel, the beautiful sound that it makes within our lives, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, we are joint heirs with Christ. And the Lord said, take it and let the world 
hear it. The sad thing is that many people are collectors but not practitioners. I want you to think about that in your life this morning. When it comes to the gospel, when it comes to theology, when it comes to your Sunday school lesson or hearing a sermon, are you a collector of sermons? You just hear them and collect them? Or are you a practitioner? Well, we're going to look this morning at a man who is truly a practitioner by the name of Paul. As I told you last week, there are several reasons why the church of Paul or the church in Rome was established. I'm not going to repeat those. But I want you to know how Paul introduces himself to the church at Rome. Notice Paul's identity. In the Greek, Paulos, doulos, Christos, Aesus, Kletos, Apostolos. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel. That's Paul's identity. I've got six points I'm going to share with you this morning, but before we get into those six points, I want you to notice this introduction because it says a lot to us. Notice how Paul describes himself. He says, Paul, a doulos. Many translations have this translated servant, but for all practical purpose, the best translation is slave. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, bond slave. So remember that Paul is not only writing to a primary Gentile audience, he's also writing to a Jewish audience. And so they would have very well understood what Paul meant when he used that word doulos. You see, in the Old Testament, a bond slave was one who had his or her freedom, but they chose not to leave. Can you think of a master coming to a slave and say, okay, you're free to go. And then that slave saying, well, I don't want to go. I like it here. Well, if that slave chose to become a bond slave, they would take the ear of that slave and they would pierce his ear or her ear as a sign that they are a bond slave. They're a slave that chose to stay. Paul says, I am that type of slave to Jesus. He's a good master. And I am willfully his bond slave. That's who I am. He doesn't promote his credentials or anything like that. He starts off by saying, I'm Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Called. Klados is that word. It also carries the idea of being chosen. Paul says, I'm called, I'm chosen. Now why would he say that? Because he wants his audience to know that this is not just an idea that he had. It's not a profession that he chose. It's not like Paul woke up one morning and said, I think I will be an apostle. No, he was called. He was chosen by God to be what? An apostolos, an apostle. Literally, that word means one who is sent. So Paul says, I'm a slave called by God and sent and set apart for the purpose of spreading, the, in the Greek, the euangelion, the, the gospel, the good news. That's who Paul is. He says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus, called, literally, chosen as an apostle, one who is sent with a with message. I have been set apart by God for the purpose of the gospel. Wow. Paul tells us here that his... The center of his life, the motivation for what he does is the gospel of God. And I think it's important, you notice how Paul refers to the gospel. He says the gospel of theos, the gospel of God. Now it's important because Paul's later going to call the gospel his gospel. He's going to say my gospel. And you would be amazed at the people who take that to mean that Paul's gospel is different from Jesus. We've had people in this church who believe that. That to truly understand the gospel, you can only read Paul 
And I said, thank you, but you won't be teaching any class here at this church. There is no contradiction between Paul and Jesus. And that is clearly here. Paul says that the gospel is the gospel of God. And the only reason that Paul calls it my gospel later on is because he has embraced it. He's obligated to it, to share it, to witness. Not that it's something that God gave him in contradiction to Jesus. But what I want you to see here is we talk about the glorious gospel and how Paul identifies himself. And why does he identify himself that way? Because of the gospel. Because of the gospel, I am a slave to Christ, a willful slave. Because of the gospel, I have been chosen and set apart. Paul says, as an apostle, one who is sent. Now, I want you to notice six foundational truths in this passage concerning the gospel. The first truth is this, or the first thing we are going to look at is the origin of the gospel. And I will tell you this, that the origin of the gospel is God himself. Again, I've already made reference to this, I don't want to belabor the point, but there is a theological heresy out there in our world today that basically says that Paul has his own gospel. It's different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. It's different from that of Jesus. There are people who actually believe that you shouldn't teach the Old Testament. You, should, you can't, they actually believe that you can't lead anybody to the Lord from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the only true gospel is represented in the writings of Paul. I would say to you, Paul would puke at that idea. As a matter of fact, Paul says that his gospel is actually finds its origin in God himself. The origin of the gospel is God. Can we not see it there? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostles, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul tells us from the very beginning that God is the origin of the gospel. It's the object, the gospel is the object of Paul's devotion. It's the reason he lives and breathes. It's the reason that he does what he does. It's the reason he travels and goes on missionary journeys. It's the reason that he starts churches. It's the reason that he endures persecution. It's the reason that he went back into Lystra to preach after almost being stoned to death. The object of his devotion is the gospel. And the origin of the gospel is God himself. The second thing that we see here is the attestation of the gospel. And the attestation of the gospel is scripture. The scripture itself attests to the gospel. And what scripture primarily does Paul have in mind? Well, look at what he says. He says, I'm set apart for the gospel which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Hagios Graphe, the Holy Scriptures. Paul says, listen, this gospel that I'm preaching, not only do, does it find its origin in God himself, but it's attested to in the Old Testament Scripture. Listen to me, beloved. The gospel is in the Old Testament. It's attested to by the prophets. When you study the Old Testament, everything is pointing to Christ and the beauty of the gospel. This is something that Christ himself proclaimed after his resurrection. Do you remember on the road to Emmaus in the last chapter of Luke? And Christ was walking with the men on the road to Emmaus. And the Bible said that he explained to them everything concerning himself from the writings of Moses and the law to the prophets. And how all those things spoke of him. Now why is Paul emphasizing this? Paul wants both Jews and Gentiles to know that this gospel is not something that he just came up with. It's not like he chose to be an apostle. He was called, he was set apart for the purpose of being apostle. For the sake of the gospel. And this gospel is not something new. It's attested to in the Old Testament scripture. 
That's the reason you can literally preach the gospel from every book of the Old Testament. And there are those who say that the Old Testament was only for the Jews and it has no application today. Stop reading your gurus and study the Bible for yourself. See, here's the truth. is One of the strongest proofs of the divine origin of the gospel is the fact that it's found in the prophecies of the Old Testament. There is essential continuity and unity between the both Old Testament and New Testament. We see this in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, we see it in Isaiah 53 concerning the suffering servant. There are tons of references in the Old Testament that bear witness to the fact of Christ's coming and resurrection and exaltation. So we see that the attestation of the gospel is the Old Testament itself. That's why to truly get an appreciation of the gospel in the New Testament is you understand and grab hold of what's being taught in the Old Testament. We see the gospel in the Exodus when the blood was applied. With every Old Testament sacrifice that was made, it's pointing us to the gospel. Every priest in the Old Testament was pointing us to the one true priest. Every king in the Old Testament was pointing us to the one true king. Every prophet in the Old Testament was pointing us to the prophet. The burning bush itself, the theophanies and the Christophanies, everything is pointing us to Christ, Christ, types and shadows all through the Old Testament. Pointing us to Christ and His gospel. So Paul says, listen, the origin of the gospel is, is God. The attestation, the proof of the gospel is found in the Old Testament scripture. And then thirdly, the substance of the gospel is Jesus Christ Himself. The substance of the gospel is Jesus. Look at what he says about Jesus. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Kardasarki. According to flesh. This is pointing to Christ's humanity. That just as the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus Christ would be born of the descendant of David. And Jesus was. He was born according to the flesh. He came in humanity, born of a virgin. But notice what he also says. And was declared to be, some of your Bibles may say appointed there. He was declared to be. He was appointed to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. We look at this passage and we have to ask ourselves a, a question. What does Paul mean here? I understand what he says, that he was descended from David according to the flesh. It's of course pointing to Christ's humanity in the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But what does he mean when he says, and was declared to be or appointed to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection? Does that mean that Christ was not the Son of God until he rose from the dead? That's what some false teachers would teach, like Marcion and others. But that's not what it means at all, because Jesus Christ is the eternal God who took upon human flesh. He was always the Son of God. So what does Paul mean when he says he was declared to be the Son of God in the power of the Holy Spirit by His resurrection? He's saying that's when it became notice to men. Think about it. Christ declared to be the Son of God throughout His ministry. But even his own apostles did not believe it until after they saw the bodily resurrection. So when he says that he was attested to or declared to be the Son of God by the power of the Holy Spirit through the resurrection, he is saying that's when the apostles and others finally understood it. That Christ indeed is not only human, but he is also fully God. And so we see in this passage that the substance of Christ, the substance of the gospel is Jesus Christ himself. And what is that substance? Is that Christ came to us as fully man and fully God. The eternal God-man who gave his life upon the cross so that we might be saved. I love what 
A.A. A. Hodge says about this passage, and I quote him. He says, when Christ is said to be constituted, appointed, or declared to be the Son of God, we are not to understand that He became or was made, but was in view of man finally self-determined. He says God has always been, Jesus has always been God. But at the point of the resurrection, it became self-determined to them that Christ was now indeed the Son of God. So as we think about this gospel message, which was the object of Paul's devotion, that's the reason I've entitled this message The Glorious Gospel, because it finds its origin in God. God himself is the author of the gospel. It's attested to throughout the Bible, from from the Pentateuch to the Law and the Prophets. Its substance is the person of Jesus Christ himself. And then we realize, what is the scope of the gospel according to this passage? The scope of the gospel is all the nations. The scope of the gospel is all the nations. If we back up there to verse 2, it says, talking about the gospel which he performed. Uh, which he promised beforehand. And by the way, uh, this is a, 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 a beautiful Greek word, that, that word promised beforehand. It's proangelio, promised. God promised, proangelio. He promised it to us beforehand through the holy graphe. Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David, Kata Sarka, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God by the power of the Deuteronomy, according to the Numa of Hagias, the Spirit of Holiness. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Look here, as we talk about the scope of the gospel. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. Some of your Bibles may say Gentiles there. But the idea is among the nations. That's the scope of the gospel is that anyone can be saved. The gospel is for everybody. It's for everyone. Without exception. Without distinction. The gospel is for the nations. No matter your skin color, your language, your economic situation, the gospel is for everyone. The scope of the gospel is the nations. That's why I plead with you so desperately to share the gospel personally. That's why I plead with us as a church to be involved in church planning and missions. And that's the reason that we have done so. We have sent out individuals from our own church. A young couple that we just commissioned arrived on the field yesterday. In order to take the gospel to the nations, the ponte ta ethne, to all ethnicities. That is the, listen, that is the scope of the gospel. And my fifth point is, is okay, what's the purpose of the gospel then? Well, he tells us here, the purpose of the gospel is the obedience of faith. He says, yes, take it to the nations, but back up to verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. The purpose of the gospel is obedience. We receive it by faith, and the fruit of faith is what? Obedience. This is the purpose of the gospel. Not that we believe it and receive it and set on our hind end. The purpose of the gospel is that we believe it, we received it, we're changed by it, and we obey God. 
That's the, why the, that's the reason that the true sign of faith is obedience. That's why James said faith without works is dead. If you say you have faith but you have no works, it's dead. It's a lie. It's an untruth. Our faith is proven by our works. Our works do not produce salvation, but they are the fruit of salvation. And Paul says, that's the reason that I take the gospel. It's not just so that people have faith, but they obey God. That's the purpose of the gospel. It's not just to save your soul, but to cause you to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. True living faith in Jesus both includes within itself an element of submission that inevitably leads to a lifetime of obedience. Can you hear me, beloved? That the purpose of God sending His Son to die upon the cross for our sins, the purpose of Christ taking upon human flesh, coming in full humanity and full deity, and to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. It's not that we can be saved and go to heaven one day. But it's so that we obey God now. For the sake of the nations. That the gospel becomes the object of our devotion. And that we take it to, from the end of our nose to the ends of the earth. Through obedience. For the sake of the nations and for the glory of God. We see here. The goal of the gospel. We just looked at the purpose of the gospel, which is obedience. But what's the goal of the gospel? Well, he tells us there. To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of what? His name. I have told you before, and I'll say it again, that the glory of God is always the issue in everything that we do. Why should we share the gospel personally? Why should our church be so involved in missions and church planning? For the glory of God. The glory of God is always the issue. Can I say that again? As a matter of fact, just say it with me to get it implanted within us. Are you ready? The glory of God is always the issue. Say it again. The glory of God is always the issue. So we look at this and Paul says, I'm a slave. I'm called. I'm set apart for the sake of the gospel. He's told us. That, and, and why? Why? Because he wants to see the nations come to faith in Christ for the glory of God, for the sake of his name. Why did Paul desire to bring the nations to obedience? It was for the sake of the glory and the honor of the name of Christ. We should be jealous for the honor of his name. We should be troubled when it remains unknown, hurt when it is ignored, indignant when it is blasphemed, and at all time anxious and determined that it shall be given the honor and the glory which are due it. I had the opportunity to go out this week on street ministry, and to the glory of God, I was able to lead a young, I don't know how young she was, but I was able to lead a woman to the Lord by the name of Rebecca. And I truly believe that her profession of faith was sincere. And then I met another gentleman who called himself a Christian, who called himself a priest. And he was using the Lord's name in vain and all type of other blasphemies. And I said to him, if you claim to know the Lord and be a man of God, then why do you blaspheme the name of God? To which Jonathan will tell you, he tried to get up into my face in an intimidating manner, which didn't work. Either I'm too stupid or something, but... I don't get intimidated easily. But that's my point. We can't stand by and just listen to someone blaspheme the name of God. It ought to, we ought to be hurt when the name of when the when the when the name of God is ignored, when the gospel is ignored. We ought to we ought to be troubled. When the gospel remains unknown in places of the world. We ought to become indignant when it is blasphemed. And we should be jealous for his name. And we should be jealous for the gospel. 
I thought about whether I would do this or not, but I'm going to do it. I never bring my phone to the pulpit, but yesterday I, I'm reading the biography of Hudson or uh, uh, Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary, one of the early missionaries, and he was uh, about to be wed to a young woman, and he knew, she knew if she married him, that she would be going to India. So she writes her father a letter asking for his consent. And this is what the letter said to her daddy. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring. To see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land. And her subjection to the hardships and the sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all this in the hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her Savior from heathen and save through her means? Wow. For the glory of God. She would leave her father never to see him again and to die on the mission field as a result of cerebral meningitis. For the sake of his name, people have gone and people have died. I would say to you, for the sake of his name, let us walk across the street and share the gospel with our neighbors with our co-workers, with our family. To sum up what I've said this morning, we've realized this, that the gospel, its origin is God the Father. Its substance is Jesus Christ, His Son. Its attestation is the Old Testament Scripture. Its scope, all the nations. Our immediate purpose in proclaiming it is to bring about the obedience of faith. But our ultimate goal is the greater glory of the name of Jesus. Therefore, we can say that the good news is the gospel of God about Christ according to the scripture for the nations unto obedience of faith for the sake of his name. So my question is, up to this point in your life, have you been a collector or a practitioner? Have you collected sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, but yet have given little obedience to what you've heard? Then you are a collector. And the beautiful sound of the gospel is kept silent. But when you put the gospel in the hands of a practitioner, oh, the beautiful noise that it makes when souls are saved. So I plead with you this morning. If you indeed have been saved by the gospel, the glorious gospel of our God, would you commit your life to being a practitioner. And I leave you with three things. A prayer that I've shared from this pulpit before. But I pray that I hope that you would pray every single day of your life. Number one, Lord, give me someone to witness to today. Lord, give me someone to witness to today. Number two, Lord, give me the awareness when you do. Lord, give me the awareness when you do. And number three, Lord, give me the courage to carry it through.
in application of this message, in the application of the glorious gospel, would you make that your daily prayer? Lord, give me someone to witness to today. Give me the awareness when you do. And then, Lord, give me the courage to carry it through. That's what it means, beloved, to be a practitioner, to the obedience of faith. Anything less is disobedience and nothing more than a collector. If you are here today and you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I plead with you this morning to receive Christ by faith. There's no work that you must perform. Christ has already done it all. But would you come to Him, surrender your life to Him, and be saved? During this time of invitation, you will have that opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and ask for our pastors to come. They'll be standing here ready to greet you and to pray with you. Others of this morning, maybe you want to make today the beginning of praying those three things. You have that opportunity to come to the altar and start praying today. Lord, give me something, somebody to witness to. Make me aware of it when you do. And give me the courage to carry it through. Father God, I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to fall upon us now and that we would move from being collectors to practitioners, Lord, so the beautiful sound of the euangelion, the gospel, can go forth to the nations and lost souls be saved. Move in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads?